Dear colleagues, it's my great pleasure to start the uh, third session of our conference today. Uh, we will present cases from Czech Republic, from Slovakia, and from Ukraine. And I would like to introduce our uh, moderators uh, and local co-organizers, Professor uh, Pavel Rosival and Professor Alena Furdova and uh, Professor Oksana Vitovska uh, from uh, these uh, countries. Um, and now I would like to uh, ask Professor uh, Rosival to introduce the first uh, uh, cases. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a really international conference around the globe, so it's difficult to say good morning, good afternoon. And uh, we would like to share with you two cases from Czech Republic. One is mine. It's a case of uh, surgery in Morganian cataract, which is relatively rare, but nowadays with long waiting times, sometimes for COVID, it's uh, appearing. So maybe it will be useful for you. And Pavel Storulka will share with you uh, also some extra case uh, because he used two keratoprothesis in one patient's one eye. So I hope you will enjoy it. And please, thank you again. You can run my video. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to share with you experience with a special type of cataract, which is called Morganian cataract. It's very advanced type of cataract and patients are usually coming saying, Doctor, I haven't seen for 10 years in one eye. Morganian cataract is a hypermature cataract caused by cortex liquefaction and descent of the heart nucleus to the bottom of capsular bag. It was described by Giovanni Battista Morgani, who was anatomist and pathologist in Padua in 18th century. In the developed but cataract surgery is normally performed when visual problems arise. Patients presenting late with Morganian cataract is much commoner in developing countries, but still occurs uncommonly in my country. Morganian cataract is a variety of corticonuclear cataract caused by rapid lens cortex liquefaction. So-called Morganian globules are formed when protein is released from damaged cortex cells. These accumulate until they replace all of the cortex. The hard lens nucleus descends with gravity to the bottom of capsular bag. Preparing patients with Morganian cataract for surgery is a little bit different from standard cases. Assessment of pot visual potential by checking accurate light projection and swinging flashlight test to reveal relative afferent pupillary defect. B-scan ultrasound study for posterior segment evaluation to rule out complicated coexisting intraocular diseases. Measurements of the corneal refractive power and immersion A scan to determine the power of the IOL required. Morganian cataract has some potential consequences. Spontaneous capsule rupture means inflammatory reaction and phacoanaphylactic uveitis. Phacolytic glaucoma lens proteins penetrate the lens capsule into the anterior chamber, occluding the trabecular meshwork, plus inflammatory reaction. Difficult capsular axis, damaged zonule, risk of nuclear drop into the vitreous, we will see in video. Endothelial cell loss from excessive phaco power usage. 
The patient was a male, born 1955, coming, saying, Doctor, I haven't seen for 10 years from the right eye. Now my left vision is getting worse. And his visual acuity was very poor in the right eye, just accurate light projection. First day after surgery, he was able to see 0.4 decimal, 6 over 15 uncorrected. After staining anterior capsule with vision broom, a circular capsular axis was begun with capsular forceps. We can see release of colliquated lens masses into the anterior chamber and out of the eye. In that moment, loose zonule precluded to continue with capsorexis, so I decided to open anterior capsule in opposite side by vanas forceps and finish capsorexis. Everything was prepared for FACO, but immediately after beginning, loose capsule was broken. Lens nucleus was moved into the entire chamber with help of viscoelastic, and thereafter, out of the eye with spoon. Capsule was removed with forceps and anterior face of vitreous was checked by spatula as was everything quiet artisan EOL was fixed on iris this typical maneuver Basal iridectomy followed. It's obligatory. Check of anterior vitreous again. It's vitrectum. And irrigation aspiration after suture. You can see quiet eye at the end of surgery. Thank you very much for your kind attention and I hope you will have not so many such complicated cases. Thank you. This film is about a patient who was blind for 16 years and who had his vision restored by a surgery in which two artificial corneas were used. The patient could only see with his better eye hand movement with correct light projection. Because the cloudy cornea was thick enough, we decided to attach the artificial cornea in the patient's own cornea. The surgery wasn't easy. First, the large blood vessels on the eye surface were cauterized. A radial mark was created on the cloudy cornea. Then, the cornea was trifened. Using a diamond knife and curved scissors, the cornea was separated.
We have created an entrance for the FACO tip at the side of temporary silicone keratoprothesis. We fixed the temporary artificial cornea with interrupted stitches. The anterior chamber under the temporary cornea was filled with OVD. Capsular hexis was performed with endoforceps through the modified entrance at the edge of the temporary silicone artificial cornea. Hydrodissection was followed by phaco emulsification of the lens. The residual cortex was aspirated by bimanual irrigation aspiration. The anterior chamber was deepened with OVD and the hydrophobic interocular lens was implanted in the bag. The stitches were released and the temporary artificial cornea was replaced by a Boston K-Pro artificial cornea, which was attached to the patient's own cloudy cornea. The backplate of the artificial cornea is made of soft acrylic and was developed at our facility as an improvement to the hard titanium original part of the Boston K-Pro. The complex of the artificial cornea with the patient's original cornea is rotated according to the radial mark to the original position and fixed with interrupted stitches. At the end of surgery, the eye was pressurized. The first day after the operation, after the eye was uncovered, the patient could see after 16 years of blindness. Visual acuity was 0.5 uncorrected, and the patient rejoiced that he could recognize different colors of shirt sleeves and even read without glasses. He also looked at his face after 16 years. He and his family were exceedingly grateful. His son says they were surprised he could see so well after such a long time. Two months after the operation, he saw 0.7 uncorrected and with a correction of minus one, minus one cylinder in the 130 degree axis he saw at 0.9. Up close, he reads at Jaeger 1 naturally. Seven months after surgery, when the borders were closed due to the coronavirus pandemic in Poland, he underwent occlusion of the retinal vessel of the right eye, which worsened his vision. One year after surgery, he can see 0.2 uncorrected and his correct visual acuity was 0.3 with minus 1.5 diopter. The patient and his family are still extremely grateful and they even brought their granddaughter to see the place where her grandfather's vision was returned to him. Thank you for your attention. This is my pleasure now to introduce uh, two cases from uh, Slovakia. The first by Dr. Jana Stefaniskova from the Department of Ophthalmology, Comenius University in Bratislava, and the second by Dr. Pavel Vesely. Uh, Dr. Stefaniskova, please. Thank you very much for your invitation. My case will be 
about the compl- uh, relatively new diagnosis, paracentral acute middle maculopathy, which is quite rare. First was described by Sharaf only in two, uh, 2013, and maybe it's a new variant of acute macular ne- ne- neuropathy, typical for this pathologic uh, red red shaped paracentral lesion. PMA, PAMA, paracentral acute uh, middle maculopathy, is typical with gray paracentral lesions. Pathologically, it's a localized capillary ischemia, typically in, uh, in uh, parapovelar um, region. Uh, for subjecti- subjective problems of the patient, it's uh, acute onset of typical scotoma. And this scotoma can improve to varying degrees during the time, but some, very often will be some remnants of this scotoma and it's persistent and uh, after also prolonged follow-up. Uh, typical findings of PMA on the OCT is in the middle retinal layers, opposite to the acute macular but is in the outer retinal layers. We don't know yet if uh, PMA is a part of the acute macular neuropathy or it's a new diagnosis. That's why with acute macular neuropathy, we uh, in literature, there is uh, this uh, uh, diagnosis, it's type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is the uh, typical for middle uh, retinal layer, it's for PMA, and the layers, uh, these uh, lesions are localized in outer plexiform layers and inner nuclear junction. And type 2, it's written that it's this. Uh, acute macular neuropathy and is localized in outer uh, plexiform layers and outer nuclear junction and it's a deep capillary plex- uh, plexus. In photographs we can see these typical findings for type 1. It's in the middle layers and is like this wet shaped uh, lesion and type 2 is in the outer retinal layers. Oh, sorry. Uh, features of the acute macular neuropathy is the uh, Risk is environmental risk factors like vasopressor, exposure, for example, caffeine, and vaccination. As I told you, this uh, uh, subjective onset is acute paracentral scotoma and uh, absence, absence of significant fundoscopic and fluorescent abnormalities. Our case is 42 years old, uh, previously healthy woman. Uh, he, she came to our department with accidents of paracentral scotoma on her left eye after flu-like illness, not really severe, but it was like uh, about two, we- uh, two weeks ago. Uh, visual acuity w- was decreased only very slow to 20 over 25. And ophthalmoscopy, uh, in ophthalmoscopy, we found paracentral wet shape opacification, which is in para uh, of uh, region. We can find it better in this red free image. Um, uh, color fundus, we don't see anything. And also of uh, fluorescent angiography, we don't see, we didn't see any leakage. And on the OCT, we perform this kind of OCT. We see typical para, uh, uh, The middle layers of the retina, and it, this uh, lesion was also responsible for the scotoma which patient was uh, described. And three months after onset, visual acuity uh, was nearly normal to 20 over 20, but patients still re- uh, recommend that there is some uh, remnants of the scotoma but scotoma decrease in density on, and on the OCT, we can see typical what is written also in the literature that after the time there is a thinning in the middle layers of the retina and atrophy. We can see it here. And we also see that only small uh, remnants of this lesion on the uh, um, fundus photography, but not very typical. 
important what to say uh, to the end. Active microneuropathy is really a rare disease, but maybe in this time, uh, maybe in this COVID time, we have to think about this disease. PMA is a new entity of microneuropathy, neuropathy, this type one, and we have to think about this disease when there is acute onset of paracentral scotoma or maybe paracentral macular lesion and pathophy, pathophysiology, pathophysiology is localized. It's a capillary ischemia in superficial capillary plexus or deep capillary, that capillary plexus. Type 1 is typical for hyperreflective bands in outer plexiform layers and inner uh, layers and with subsequent thinning in the inner layers. And type 2 is typical for hyperreflective bands in the outer layers of the retina with thinning or in the outer nucleus. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now it's a time for the next presentation for, from Dr. Pavel Vesely, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pavel Veseli, and I come from Veseli Eye Clinic, located in Bratislava, Slovakia. Today, I would love to speak about visual disorders that are connected to alcohol syndrome. Our patient is a 20-year-old male who is suffering with alcohol syndrome linked to his X chromosome. He was dialyzed since the age of 19. Unfortunately, he is deaf to left ear and has hearing deterioration to the right ear. His visual acuity of left eye was always better than on the right eye. Visual acuity of the right eye was 0.05 and on the left eye 0.1. No additional correction would improve his visual acuity. Cornea was clear. With no sign of keratoconus nor corneal dystrophies. Retina of the left eye showed no pathology, while retina of the right eye showed mild epiretinal membrane. His poor visual acuity urged us to search for the reason why is it so. First examination and measurement we did was the measurement and examination of his biometry, where you can see mild difference between axial length of the right eye and left eye, and presence of astigmatism on the right eye and smaller one on the left eye. Right afterwards, we performed measurement of his topo corneal topography. Here, corneal astigmatism is present also on both eyes. The pachymetry is distributed evenly and anterior surface corresponds with the posterior surface. This still wasn't enough to find out where the problem was. Afterwards, we decided to measure his higher order aberrations. Unfortunately, we lost footage of this measurement and that's why we are using illustrative picture that is very similar to the result as we got after the measurement. Here, you can see extremely high spherical aberration, which actually also changes the result or the map of the wavefront higher order aberrations. Afterwards, we start, in think we start thinking of a very specific uh, ocular diagnosis. When we performed the anterior segment OCT, the diagnosis was almost 100% sure, and it was lenticonus of the lens. The only way how to improve visual acuity of our patient was a lens surgery, and this we also planned. It was a femtosecond laser-assisted lens surgery with a monofocal aspheric lens implantation. Due to the astigmatism, uh, we planned also intrastromal arcuate incisions, but only to the left eye, as there was this epiretinal membrane present on the right eye. Both surgeries were planned to be performed with a one-week break. This is the femtosecond laser treatment uh, planning for the right eye, where you can see the size of capsular axis and the volume of uh, lens fragmentation uh, done with a femtosecond laser. Here is a short video. After clear corneal incision and paracentesis that were performed with calibrated knives, not with a femtosecond laser, anterior capsule uh, was removed. Afterwards, 
a mild hydrodissection and rotation of the nucleus was performed. After this, mild aspiration of the nucleus is being uh, performed. There is no phantos uh, phaco energy uh, used due to a soft lens and a fragmentation of the uh, nucleus. Fragmentation of the nucleus with femtosecond laser makes aspiration of the lens very easy and very unharmful. Afterwards, irrigation aspiration of the cortex is performed. After irrigation and aspiration, a new lens is implanted. It's a monofocal single piece IOL that is implanted only with aspiration of BSS. We are trying to use as little as possible viscoelastic materials. After the lens is being located in the back, hydration of the wounds and intracranial antibiotics are applied. Here is the postoperative result of the right eye. Visual acuity was although improved but very little to 0.1. Best corrected distance visual acuity was 0.15. Cornea was clear with no edema, uh, PCOL was in situ and red reflex was present. Patient, although the surgery was successful, was unhappy due to the poor postoperative visual acuity and was very negative to the left eye surgery. Anyway, he came back seven days later as his family asked him to undertake the second surgery. This is the plan for the left eye. As you can see, same size of capsule rexus, same volume of uh, phaco fragmentation with a femtosecond laser, and also intrastromal arcuate incision. This is a top view of the plan. Intrastromal arcuate incisions, fragmentation and capsule rexis. And this is how it was done. Fragmentation, capsule rexis, plus the intrastromal arcuate incisions. After the surgery, the visual acuity of the left eye improved to 1.0. Cornea was clear with no edema, IOL was in place, and the red reflex was also present. In conclusion, I can say that although the visual acuity on the right eye didn't improve much, we saw significant improvement of visual acuity on the left eye from 0.1 to 1.0. Improvement of visual acuity is, from our point of view, uh, strictly bind or strongly bind with resolving spherical aberration that has caused visual acuity deterioration. At the end of the day, I can say our patient was very happy. Final diagnosis was bilateral lenticonus in Alport syndrome. Thank you very much for your attention. And bye-bye. Dear colleagues, my greeting to you. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Vanik Kostanyan from Podilia Vision Center, Vinnytsia City, Ukraine, and I'm co-author of this clinical case presentation. And another co-author is Dr. Yulia Seldon, Associate Professor of the Department of Ophthalmology in National Pirogo Memorial Medical University. And we would like to present you clinical case. We don't have any financial interest. So background, male, 37 years old. Uh, compliance, some minor relative scotoma, so the central field of vision. Uh, had six months ago had coronavirus disease. No, uh, no, uh, no history of eye diseases and haven't had any eye examination for more than 15 years and uh, no family history of eye diseases. So eye exam uh, visus uh, on both eyes 2020, intraocular pressure within normal limits, uh, visual fields, uh, some minor relative scotomas at foveal area of both eyes. Mm, anterior segment within normal limits. So let's see fundosco fundoscopic examination of the right eye. We can see on the 
uh, fundus photography we can see well-defined elevated yellow orange lesions there they are multiples and uh, on the OCT we can see that that lesions are located in subretinal space and on fundus autofluorescence we can see hyper autofluorescences of these lesions the same clinical picture in the left eye so differential diagnosis is best vitelliform macular dystrophy adult fovea macular vitelliform dystrophy age-related macular degeneration, dominant drusen, central serous retinopathy, and to toxoplasmatic retinochoroiditis. And our diagnosis is best vitelliform macular dystrophy. Uh, so what diagnostic testings, tests we need, do we need? Uh, OCT, we performed it, fundus autofluorescence, and of course it will be good to have genetic testing for to test for mutation in the best one gene, but uh, it is a pity it is impossible in Ukraine. Uh, we tried to do uh, fluorescein angiography, but uh, patient failed to that test. Uh, he he was moving his eyes, so he failed to test. But best disease can usually be diagnosed clinically. Uh, best vitelliform vitelliform macular dystrophy in up to. 30% of patients it can be uh, present with multiple lesions it is called multiple uh, multiple best uh, multifocal best vitelliform macular dystrophy and it uh, has six stages stage 1 previteliform stage with normal vision and uh, only subtle rp changes can be uh, noticed Mm, stage 2, vitelliform stage, when classic egg yolk lesions uh, can, uh, is located in the posterior fundus, uh, vision is normal, and this patient has uh, stage 2 of this disease. Stage 3, pseudohypopion, uh, when layering of lipofacin is uh, going on. Uh, stage, stage 4, vitelliraptive, uh, breakup of material gives scrambled egg appearance. Stage 5 is atrophic when uh, changes in RP uh, happens and stage 6 CNV if it can be in 20% of patients. So our patient has uh, second stage of this disease and treatment, uh, no medical or surgical treatment exists. In case of CNV, anti-VGF medications can be considered and gene therapies or stem cell based retinal pigment epithelial transplantation uh, can be considered if future clinical trials prove their efficiency and of course if if it will be affordable for patient thank you for your attention good afternoon and dear colleagues my name is Irina Blagun. I'm a head doctor and vitro-retinal surgeon in ophthalmological clinic Ocular, situated in Ukraine, Kyiv. Today, let me introduce a retinal hemorrhage case wrapper to you. In the first slide, we can get known with the anamnesis of the patient. On the 5th of May 2021, 68-year-old male patient came to our clinic with complaints of a dark spot in front of the right eye. He has had his complaints for 10 days. At the same time, when the dark spot uh, appeared in front of his right eye, he noted an increasing of the blood pressure. In the anamnesis, we determined that he has hypertensive heart disease, second stage, and he takes aspirin cardio. Also, he has diabetes type 2 and he has insulin therapy. Objectively, we examined that the visual acuity of his right eye was 0.1 in decimal units. Intraocular pressure on this eye was 14 mm of mercury and optical coherence tomography showed the presence of hyperreflective material in the subretinal area. As you can see on the fundus, there is blood under the subretinal area, so there is subretinal hemorrhage. 
Let me remind the classification for macular hemorrhages developed by Sylvia Bob and Alireza Minshaki. This classification evaluates prognostic factors that allow the clinic to assess the potential outcome of blood circulation and give realistic search results. Assistant surgery selects the appropriate treatment tactics in each case. And as you can see on the slide, the classification system for macular hemorrhages describe foveal involvement, retinal layers, age, cause, and size of the hemorrhage. Therefore, returning to our patient, we considered classification for determination the best way of treatment. We can see that hemorrhage in our patient according to all the parameters of the classification is treatable. But the surgeon needs to be very careful because the blood is under the pigment epithelium and its dislocation can lead to the rupture of the pigment epithelium. As you can see on this slide, according to the angio coherence optical tomography data, there is no vascularization in the macular area. On the next day, we performed FACA emulsification with intraocular lens implantation and posterior vitrectomy with drain and retinotomy and hexafluoretan gas endotamponate C2F6. As you can see on the video, I tried to drainage the retinal blood using different instruments. Firstly, I tried to wash away the blood through the retinotomy, but it was unsuccessful. Then I put perftor decalin to push it aside, but the same. I want to remind that from the moment of the hemorrhage beginning past 10 days. Finally, after one hour of exertion, I succeeded and removed the blood from the subretina. We finished with laser photocoagulation around the retinotomy, ear gas exchange, and 1 mm hexafluoretan gas and the tamponade C2 F6. On the 20th day, the visual acuity was 0.2 and 0.8 with the diaphragm. In the vitreal cavity, the gas air mixture is 20%. According to the optical coherence tomography, retinal hyperreflective material reduced in size significantly. And on this slide, you can see optical coherence tomography in different days after the beginning. On the upper one, um, it was on the 5th of May 2021, when uh, the patient came firstly to us, the visual equity was 0 0.1, and we see the huge subretinal hemorrhage. Next time, uh, on 28th of May, uh, the visual equity was 0 0.10 with diaphragm, and we see that the uh, subretinal hemorrhage reduced a lot. On the 25th of uh, June, the visual equity was 0 0.8 without a diaphragm. And as we can see on the 28th of uh, July, the visual equity uh, it was 0 0.9. And what is main that there was absence of main complaint of dark spot in front of the right eye. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Now we can start the discussion. And of course, uh, um, I invite uh, all moderators uh, to also uh, present uh, the questions to the uh, speakers. But let me start with some questions from the audience. We have a few questions. Uh, mm, the first is a question to uh, Professor Rossival. Uh, mm, and, uh, Starting as a comment for Morganian cataracts, anterior capsule removal can also be done under air. Pavel, do you have any experience with such an approach? It's a good question. 
of course error can be used uh, in this case was not a problem with with uh, capsular access because uh, capsula was a little bit fibrous but it was not a case of uh, as a problem problem was in this case loose i, I have done several such uh, and this one was uh, one of them i didn't have such complication anytime uh, as uh, as uh, Zonal were very loose. Even I had uh, on under under the under the lens, I had a chopper to protect uh, capsule from movement. Despite that, uh, when I have started just as a anterior part uh, with uh, FACO, it sucked very loose uh, zonal, very loose capsule, and it was broken. So I had to cho change my plan. So was not a problem with capsular axis, problem was with uh, break posterior capsule, even that I expected some movement and protected it. So it was a case, fortunately, it happened and uh, I reacted immediately. So anterior vitreous was not touched. So it, in fact, it was some kind of nice, I can say nice intracapsular cataract extraction. And uh, we can use this uh, lens for for the iris, and not necessary to use complicated suturing and other other procedures, which are nowadays really popular. But uh, but I don't like them too much. Thank you for this uh, answer. But we have another question. As a matter of fact, the same question I uh, had in my mind when I was watching your video. Uh, but uh, well, so I would ask this anyway. But this was a question about uh, why you put the artisan iris claw IOL, IOL uh, anteriorly, not posteriorly. Is it your routine uh, approach? I usually use it so because uh, it's a lens which was intended to anterior chamber, not to the posterior one. I know that it's used in this way. Sometimes I try it as well. But I don't feel to have such a good control because when I extract or as other damage uh, lens can be lost to the posterior segment. So if you have lens in anterior one, it's much better control and uh, no problem with uh, dislocation. Thank you. And the question to uh, Dr. Stoduka, uh, is it routine to put hydrophobic IOL in such a complicated cases? And why is that, Pavel? Oh Yes, nowadays, I think most of the surgeons do prefer hydrophobic uh, lenses for complicated cases because it has been published that uh, there is a higher risk of uh, IOL calcification in such complex cases and with uh, multiple surgical uh, interventions with uh, hydrophilic lenses. So that's why we do prefer hydrophobic lens. Yeah, I especially, if I may, especially yeah. in cases when uh, vitreous surgery is done thereafter and uh, some gases are used and so on. So this has not so much, uh, so much posterior capsule pacification as well. I, I completely agree. I mean, uh, we should very much aware about the possibility of the opacification of hydrophilic IOLs in the future due to some uh, different surgeries. Uh, so, uh, and the, the evidence is increasing. So, uh, probably for the safety of the patient, we should move more and more into hydrophobic IOLs. Uh, yeah. I yeah, uh, Andre, I, I agree. I, I think that's uh, the trend in, in uh, Europe and uh, in uh, other territories. On the other side, I think we should also uh, remember that hydrophilic uh, materials also have their advantages. Uh, generally, it's easier to fold these lenses into smaller incisions. It's easier to handle them. They have uh, less reflections and then uh, less photic phenomena. Uh, so maybe we need to find a balance and maybe the development in the future will also improve the hydrophilic and hydrophobic as well. In the past, uh, the, some of the most popular hydrophobic uh, IOLs had a problem with glistening, which, which is also something uh, quite often progressive. So let's keep an eye on both. But I do agree that 
nowadays we are leaning more and more towards hydrophobic. And of course, the price is different. Of course, I mean, the, the hydrophilic are much cheaper. So uh, it might be also a factor in many places. But nevertheless, as we all as we know that the opacification of hydrophobic IORs, uh, namely glistenings, they do not interfere with the visual acuity so much as calcifications. They do not uh, do not lead to the explantations of the of the IORs uh, so often. There are only a few cases, as a matter of fact, in the lit all literature. So, uh, but the but the, the the evidence of uh, of the calcification of hydrophilic areas is, is is very strong. I mean, and, yeah. Thank you for this discussion. And the uh, um, uh, let's let me move to the uh, yeah. This is another question, Pavel, uh, to you. Um, uh, could you give an advice how to prevent possible complications such as retroconial membranes or glaucoma in such a complicated in such a cases? Well, we need to uh, say that uh, such complex eyes have uh, uh, have uh, some risks associated long term. Uh, the two most uh, common risks are uh, the infections. So they uh, use long term antibiotic uh, drops uh, as long as they have their uh, prosthesis in place. They apply daily uh, some antibiotic drops. And the second uh, uh, most common risk is glaucoma. It's impossible to uh, accurately measure their intraocular pressure. So we suspect glaucoma and we quite often uh, combine uh, this uh, artificial corneas with uh, some drainage uh, implants. Uh, so it's uh, it's difficult. Uh, having said that, our first uh, K-PRO patient is almost 15 years uh, with the Capro and she's still with no glasses and okay but we did lost uh, we did lose some of the eyes meantime of the other patients so there are some risk associated and I believe the retroprosthetic membrane is also one of the problems which can be surgically uh, solved in most of the cases, but sometimes it requires multiple interventions, which is also not good. Uh, quite often, uh, here are the uh, the last eyes of the patient with high risks, so we try to avoid any unnecessary interventions. So we do have risks, and therefore also I only indicate artificial cornea for blind people who do not see uh, with their other eyes either. So it's really intended for blind patients. Thank you. I, may, I have a notice to Pavel Vesely case. It was very interesting because uh, such patients are very rare. And maybe the reason for the right eye poor vision was some amblyopia because I have noticed on materials that there were some differences in the eyes. And for that reason, maybe right one was uh, amblyopic, so not possible to visualize. But we have experience in such cases, maybe if not too long or before was visual quite good, maybe in the long time, one year, two years, such eye can get much better vision. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your note, uh, Professor Osival. Yes, that's what we were thinking also, that the amblyopia would be the reason. To be true, um, communication with the patient was very tough um he didn't recall to any other to any of our questions about the history of his visual acuity uh he could remember a year or two ago before the surgery not at his childhood so we didn't know if he could compare the visual acuity of both eyes so we didn't get much information uh from his life uh, nor from his parents uh who didn't remember that there would be a difference between the visual acuity of one uh, and the and the other eye. So yes, but at the end of the day, after both surgeries, we assumed that there was amblyopia present on the right eye. So uh, I agree with your I agree with your comment. Thank you. We have. Are there uh, any questions? Yeah, we we still have some questions from the audience, and they are still coming. But uh, so uh, the the question to Doctor Vesely. Uh, did you consider EDOF in this case, or you skipped it because of possible amblyopia in the right eye? And there is also another, well, related question, why not EDOF in the left eye in this patient? 
Well, first of all, we need to make clear what an EDOF lens is. This patient, I don't know if it's free or not. I have no interest at all. Um, um, the lens that was implanted was Technus eye hands. That means it was a progressive monofocal lens, um, not a standard EDOF as we know with the concentric rings, but still uh, adding some adding some visual acuity uh, with its spherical aberration uh, of the lens. Uh, why we didn't think of any program on any premium uh, IOL? There was there were two reasons. We know that the it's a uh, Alport syndrome is bound with a collagen four uh, uh, problems, and sometimes even a corneal problems may occur. And uh, be, not talking about the the dot E flag uh, dot A flag uh, retinal dystrophy that can sometimes occur with this with this uh, disease. And but the corneal problem, the the corneal uh, problems um, combined with the Alport syndrome could actually make problem with the uh, with a pro premium IOL. So that's why we went the monofocal lens way instead of implanting lens that would be uh, premium. So that is the reason. But the patient got the best possible lens uh, at that moment uh, from the fam uh, family of monofocal lenses. Thank you. And we have two questions to Dr. Saldan. Uh, so the first question, did you try TPA subretinally? And the second, for subretinal hemorrhages, is ICG a good tool for diagnostics? I hope that uh, Dr. Saldan is with us. Yes, uh, it Yeah. Uh, no, we cannot. We cannot uh, hear the 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 answer or any contact with Doctor Sun. Okay. They should be here. Okay, so so the next question, uh, one of the last probably questions again to Professor Rossival. Uh, after your answer to the anterior approach of the Iris Glow uh, IOL, the question is: If you put the artisan anteriorly, is there any danger to endothelial decompensation in the long run? What do you think? It's different because this lens was. Uh was uh, invented by Jan Worst for effekia. So it's the lens for effekia. It's a completely different for the lenses which are used for refractive reasons because there is no lens. So it's a deep anterior chamber. And in those lenses, uh, danger for endothelium is not considered as serious and uh, it's really very, very rare. So it's completely opposite to situation which is uh, when we put such lens as refractive, uh, such lens also has different co construction. So in such case, it's maybe more, uh, more cosmetic appearance is better when it's put behind the iris. The truth oh. is, if I may, if there comes to a damage to endothelium, it's mostly iatrogenic during the surgery uh, of an unskilled uh, surgeon. It's very rare to see, as Professor Rossival said, uh, damage to the endothelium a month, two, uh, or year two or three after the surgery, since the anterior chamber is very, very deep. So if there is a damage, it's mostly iatrogenic during the surgery. Nevertheless, also, excuse me. Yeah. And sure. also this lens has been implanted in maybe at least uh, 10,000, but much more cases so we have vast experience with maybe it's in the labor days but 30 years ago it was lens was really very frequently used after a fakia after intracapsular cataract surgery and this type of surgery i did in this case was in fact uh, clean intracapsular cataract surgery thank you also, I personally use the posterior approach, I must say, because I generally believe that the optical 
uh, position for the IOL should be within the uh, behind the iris, let's say. <laughs> so uh, th that's why I, 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 I started with the anterior position because I believe that, uh, well, it, it's probably easier uh, also. However, then moved into the posterior approach. This is what I use uh, uh, presently. Uh, okay. Uh, are there any other questions? It is uh, now a question to our moderators or speakers, uh, Professor Vitovska or uh, Professor Rossiva. Uh, may, uh, may I comment a little bit uh, about uh, the uh, ICG? Uh, unfortunately, in Ukraine, it's not registered and we, have, uh, we haven't such option in our practice. Uh, so uh, that's why uh, now uh, in the majority of cases, uh, we use uh, NGO uh, OCT uh, for diagnosis uh, and uh, maybe in the case uh, of uh, one if this is multifocal uh, best uh, vitelliform macular dystrophy it could be used but we don't have such uh, opportunities really and it's problem for us even fluorescent and geography now is also problem for it uh, I have a question uh, about uh, if it's possible uh, one question only um, for the speaker um, who gave us uh, the clinical case, my, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Pavel Vasily, uh, about um, that uh, lenticonus. Uh, do you have any um, uh, proposals or recommendation for calculation of, uh, calculation of IOL uh, power in these cases? Um, is it any uh, specific maybe management to this? I'm sorry, I had to unmute. To be true, I started thinking about this after the after the first surgery. Uh, if I should modify or I should not modify the the a the the calculation, but then actually what I did was a ma small math and realized that there is no change to axial length uh, due to the lenticonus and there is no change to corneal topography. Uh, that means the K readings. So uh, we we stay with the calculation and actually the truth came out with the second eye where we had uh, excellent results. So no no additional change to the to the biometrical calculations of the IOL power. Maybe if there was the if there was corneal uh, symptoma of Alport syndrome present, uh, I would then I might change it because that makes the cornea a little bit more irregular. But at this at this stage of my as my patient was in, we did not change the calculations at all. Thank you very much. I think we need to finish the discussion. It was a very good discussion. And thank you for all very interesting and educative cases. Uh, and I would like to share a special thanks to our moderators and local co-organizers because they help us to organize this session. So namely, uh, Professor Oksana Vitoska, Professor Elena Fudova, and Professor Paolo Rossival. Thank you very much. And now I would like to announce the break. We have the 15 minutes break and then the next session, which starts half past five. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye bye.